thank you so much arundhati for joining us on this uh, for this conversation i mean there's just so much so much to talk about but i would like to begin by talking about the fact that your second novel is now in going to be in 49 languages you've always in your work related to real life events on the ground and very disturbing happenings around you and yet you immerse yourself in very very high quality fiction i mean do you think that's a very rare thing for a writer difficult you know i mean i think that people make this uh, mistake <coughs> to think that fiction is somehow untrue actually good fiction has to be true and i'm not talking about true in terms of facts and figures yeah, yeah, yeah. but true as in music is true you know as you know that when you hit the right note it is a true note so it's an imaginary garden surely but it's full it it's 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 tap roots of all the plants in it come from a place which is true you know and um, so i don't know why people sort of seem to seem to s suggest that you have fiction that has to be purely imaginary and then you have non fiction whereas for me the line is an osmotic one and uh, none of what i write in the ministry of utmost happiness uh, would have been even ethical if i was just imagining massacres and lynchings and brutalization uh, you know these are the things that or caste or gender or yeah. all of it you know yeah. it is the substance of the air we breathe and and yeah. you know coming to the substance of the air that we breathe today but, uh, sorry, sorry i mean just if i may say it, no, please. that and yet fiction literary fiction is not um factual you know when people go around trying to say oh this is so and so and this is so and so that is reductive and yeah, stupid yeah, yeah. but but the the air is true you know yeah so actually that's that's a very very robust point if you look at the journey that you have made and say your environs have made since the god of small things and the ministry of utmost happiness uh you see a whole arc which goes this way or goes below the earth i don't know how so where are we today well in a very dangerous place you know in a very very dangerous place because we um you know when uh, when uh, the massacre in gujarat happened I certainly was one of those people who who made the mistake of believing that if you just describe what happened and if you sort of bring it out in all sorts of ways whether it is whether it's uh, in your outrage whether it's in your writing whether it's in court with whatever you know that that would be enough Uh, to create a, a climate where it couldn't happen again but in fact you actually uh, came up against a terrifying scenario in which there were people who said so what or they deserved it and you know it became in some ways the the massacre became an election campaign it became something to be proud of and today Uh, we have a prime minister who was chief minister at the time who who has refused ever to admit any wrongdoing or neglect and uh, so you know whether whether this path to power came despite the massacre or because of it is something which is a very troubling point you know it's a very troubling point because we are not talking about I mean on the one hand sure there's individual account accountability and certain people murdered certain other people certain people raped certain other people certain people burnt certain other people yes but what sort of a society is it in which this kind of thing is not uh, abhorrent you know so it sets off a very complex current and uh, 
Uh, today, of course, we've seen uh, we've seen a, a situation in which um, you have a, a whole cultural configuration, a nationalist configuration, a Hindu nationalist configuration, who has ridden to power on uh, on on a manifesto of hatred. But now, what you're seeing is a, you know. When you, uh, when you put that kind of hatred down on the table and you think that you can control it and say, oh, it's just between Hindus and Muslims. No, it's an idea. It's a way of thinking. And then that, that way of thinking can infect relationships between castes, between classes, between genders, between uh, ethnicities. And so you know, this is a country where everybody is a minority in some way or the other. And once you light those fires, they may burn for a thousand years. Yeah. You know, you made a very interesting point earlier that, and now that uh, uh, we've seen this kind of hatred which has been legitimized in a way uh, through a political campaign, uh, and uh, which is communal hatred, but we've also lived with centuries of caste uh, violence and which is like an everyday thing which we tolerate in one sense as a society uh, state sort of abolished untouchability in the constitution but we didn't ab abolish caste and there are all these kind of and there are these symbols which still anger people when the Dalit uh, man decides to become a bridegroom on a horse or you know decides to take the name of Singh in Gujarat you know because it's a Rajput name and all sorts of things you know the thing about caste is you know that uh, when it comes to caste, the, the real violence is more than just the flogging and the yeah, killing, yeah. you know. Because caste itself as a social structure is a, f is a form of violence yeah. and it can only be uh, kept in place by the continuous threat of violence. Yeah. The continuous threat. So it's a... Uh, it's an abomination that I, I, I frankly don't know how ha it has it has passed under the international radar of all kinds of outrage for, for so long. But uh, it is, you know, it is obviously complex and simple at the same time because it's, uh, it's not, uh, in a way, casteism and racism is the same thing. But it's not just white people uh, you know, oppressing black people, but a system in which so society is divided into an infinite, not an infinite, but a finite hierarchy, I mean, uh, levels of hierarchy, and each one is, 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 is then wired into that sense of a vertical hierarchy, you know. So it's only, not only those at the very top, but all the way down the line that uh, that is has been indoctrinated to think in these ways, you know. So, but caste, the violence of caste is not just the violence of the flogging, the killings, the uh, lynchings. You know, the the violence of caste is in its daily implementation, in its belief that certain people have are entitled to less than other people. In, in, its, in, in the way uh, democracy and elections and constituencies are configured. And within caste, of course, the whole notion of untouchability is so abhorrent, you know, that uh, you have, of course, the overall segregation and exclusions. Yeah. And then the fact that you can actually think of fellow humans as being so impure as to be untouchable, which is legitimized by some sections of the scriptures, you know, so. Yeah, so that's uh, the one difference between caste and race, that race created by the human mind and caste is, they, they pretend that it is sanctioned in some divine way, you know, which, which makes it uh, so hard to even uh, overcome because yeah. it is imbued with religious belief. Yeah, so we, we had the Manual Scavenging Act passed only in 2013. Uh, I don't know why it was not passed soon after independence because we have Article 374 which says that our law should have got constitutionalized 
uh, soon after we became independent and that's what Ambedkar said that you know we are giving ourselves political independence but not economic and social equality so that is the problem you know on all of this that it you know you might have a legal system you might have a you might have laws you might have a constitution but you don't have I mean society is way behind the constitution because obviously uh, uh, Ambedkar uh, uh, was an enlightened person you know way beyond his time, his time. Uh, and the, the uh, today I mean coming back to the here and now uh, we've had this spate of attempted arrests and some arrests actually we have had raids on the homes of lawyers and activists and academics uh, Fortunately, the Supreme Court has stepped in uh, day before yesterday, which was very, very welcome. Uh, and one thing about that entire the drama of the last three days was, you know, S Professor Satyanarayan's comment uh, and his uh, Rao's daughter's comment that, you know, the police kept asking me that why you're not wearing a sari and why don't you have sindoor in your head? Uh, so, I mean, how do you see this panning out? I mean, this this regime which has probably taken authoritarian fascism to its testing limit under the constitutional framework. Well, it's gone outside the constitution framework already, you know, but uh, see the way I see things right now, I mean, that's what I was trying to say yesterday at the press conference and is that uh, there are, you know, there are, uh, you, you also know from your experience in Gujarat, that the dangerous time came and the massac Gujarat massacre happened at a time when uh, the ruling party there was losing popularity, losing election. These are very dangerous times, you know. So that is the situation right now. Surveys have shown uh, actual data analysis of real voting in the by-elections um, have shown a serious drop in approval and popularity. So two things have to be done to regain that. One is that you've got to consolidate your own constituency. And the other is that you have to obviously divide the opposition. And you have to divert attention away from the reasons why your popularity is dropping. These are the things that we are witnessing right now. So uh, obviously, you know, while the the communal pot is is kept on the boil you have a situation that uh, in which uh, you know the the disaster of demonetization which everybody felt but now the figures are out and the, reserve bank is the reserve bank has said that 99.3 percent of the money has come back the papers are reporting the cash economy is larger than it ever was uh, other newspapers like the guardian have reported that it likely caused a 1% shrinkage in the GDP, that 1.5 million jobs were lost. So this is something that's affecting everybody and particularly the poorest people, you know. And, and the betrayal of a, a person who comes to power, a, 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 an organization that comes to power promising 15 lakhs in everyone's bank account and then does demonetization, it's, it's, a, it's an outrage, you know, that. then. The whole, the whole business of corruption, which is all the basis on which the UPA fell with those 40 days of agitation and so on. Look at the Rafael deal now, you know, I mean, the allegations are of unimaginable corruption. So the, you know, the demand is by all opposition parties that there should be a joint parliamentary probe. Is that going to happen? God knows. Um, if you look at things like Obviously, the, the distress in the agricultural sector, you look at farmer suicides, all of that is creating anger, which people don't have to look to newspapers to, to understand because it's happening to them. It's happening to them. You know, the TV channels don't have to tell them. Now, the only thing to do is to, to say, oh, but all this distress is in order for the great Hindu Russia to come. Which is, I mean, which is a very, uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a foolish move. It's, a, it's something that, you know, can sell, you know, it, it yeah. could. But uh, if you look at 
what is happening? I mean, the, 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 during the UPA government, you had the huge attack on Adivasis in Bastar. But now the attack is on Dalits too, always disguised as action against Maoists. You know, earlier it was only Adivasis who were called Maoists. Now it's also Dalits, which is an insult to assertions of Dalit pride, Dalit leadership, uh, you know, making them out to be people who are just manipulated by this handful of urban Naxals or whatever they want to call them, you know. And uh, so, so, but at the same time, you know, there is going to be a great wooing of that constituency because that is 150 years old, you know, that, uh, you know, Ghar Vapsi starting, it started in the 1870s, you know. So, uh, in some ways, if you if you look back at Gauraksha, Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan, uh, Gharvapsi, all these things, and they have a 150 year old history, you know. So, uh, we are living in those times, and I don't. I mean, I I, I have a sense that people's mood is shifting, but. I mean, that means the most dangerous times because whether, whether this, you know, trying to drag people back into that, uh, into that cauldron of hatred, whether it's going to be, you know, we've seen now the police have, uh, because of the investigation into the assassination or murder of Gauri Lankesh, you've seen uh, those in uh, you know those uh, those organizations. organizations being exposed, but how many more of them are there? God knows, you know how many more of them are plotting things, and where are they plotting? Where is the fireball going to fall? You know where is the false flag attack or the bomb blast or the killing or the lynching going to happen to roil up people's feelings? I don't know. So complicated, difficult times, challenging times, but also uh, also. Uh, I think people are showing incredible humor and courage and stepping up to the plate in ways which is wonderful, you know. And do you feel worried and scared personally at any time? Because you've had to bear the most vile attacks at different points of time in the last 10 years. No, I mean, I, I, I don't feel, I mean, I don't allow myself to feel that because I just think all of us are uh, you know, I mean, I don't want to put myself in a special category yeah. of danger because I think everybody who speaks out, and in my case, the stakes are just higher, you know, in the sense that because, uh, you know, because of, uh, I mean, I don't think any, well, I hope uh, nothing happens, but mm -hmm. I, I don't think we should allow ourselves to be spooked by that, you know, yeah. because it is something that Personally, for me, I, uh, I, I don't want to be loved by these people, so I don't mind their insults at all, <laughs> you know. Your home state recently went through a terrible, terrible flood. And uh, this morning I saw a tweet by the State Finance Minister of Kerala saying that the Chief Minister's Relief Fund had crossed 1,000 crores, mm -hmm. uh, you know, of Indian donations when, when you have a very, very petty central government not allowing foreign aid to come in, despite the fact that NDA won had allowed crores to come in for the Gujarat earthquake in 2001. Uh, how did you feel when that happened I and mean, this kind of discourse, which I mean, this tremendous resilience from within and outside Kerala, a lot of support from the rest of India? Well, I felt, um, I mean, you know, obviously it's not, it's not perfect what has happened there because I know I mean, from personal friends that uh, there have been uh, there have been uh, caste issues. You know, I, I I know like people in my own hometown where Dalit families have a separate relief camp, and you know, uh, money is not getting there, and uh, so on. But on the whole, on the whole, I felt uh, I felt like from from hearing stories and from. Hearing, uh, yeah, you felt you felt like, yeah, that's the kind of place I'd like to belong to, you know, and that's the kind of place we could all belong to, if only, uh, if only there was a slightly more long-term 
idea of how things should be because it could be a wonderful place this if people were if it was the kind of place that a society that people wanted to belong to people in the northeast people in kashmir you know you it's not impossible to have a revolutionary vision of a society because it doesn't have to get there it has to be there you know it's not there is no society that is just anywhere in the world but are we yearning for justice are we moving towards justice or are we moving in the opposite direction if you have a sense that people are trying that people have a vision that people want to move towards egalitarianism you know then the imperfections and the flaws are one thing but if you seeing everyone in power leaning in the opposite direction you see the elites you see the majoritarianism and it's all leaning in the opposite direction then uh, what hope is there you know a few words on the opposition today the political opposition i mean we know that from the ground we feel that the mood is changing people are looking up people are fighting back at various levels the political opposition today seems to be in better shape than it was a few months ago and they seem to be talk of alliances to make sure that this regime doesn't come back to power how do you see that well i see that you know one thing is is an alliance which is based on agreement and you know a common minimum program and so on another thing is an alliance uh, see what i see now is a situation where on every side it's a battle for survival the bjp is is going to fight for survival because people know that if they lose it, it it's not just that they'll be out of power but they could be in serious trouble you know i mean there are a lot of things building up which are disturbing and extremely worrying for example the death of justice loya the very questionable death of justice loya you know where is that going to end or lead? i mean i i know the courts have thrown it out for now but i don't think it's going to go away you know now on the side of the opposition i think the if you take the congress or you take samajwadi or you take the bsp i think they are, they are fighting for their own survival for their existence you know another 5 years uh, of this uh, will they even exist anymore you know so the alliance is also their alliances are based on a kind of need to survive which is a good thing which is a good thing i believe that uh, i believe that you know i mean i'm speaking from my experience of kerala for example as opposed to west bengal you know the fact that no party has been able to consolidate itself for 40 years like the cpm did in in west bengal is a very good thing you know i think even if you're like me who has not that much faith in uh, you know the goodness of governments when they come i mean parties or the state when it comes to power i i see myself as a person who's decided to be in an oppositional space i have criticized them all the cpm the congress everyone so so from my experience in kerala you know the fact that that state has never had a, a government coming back to power twice in a row unlike say the consolidation of power in west bengal by the cpm for so many years it creates a kind of rot you know it creates an arrogance it creates a, 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 a violence so even whereas in kerala the cpm and the congress have never been given that opportunity by people you know which is great and uh, i feel that in in um in india even though you know you take someone like me who's who is a person who believes that i am i am a part of society i'm not a part of the state i have deliberately put myself in that oppositional space i refuse to think like a state right so uh whoever comes to power obviously one will be oppositional to them but i think that today uh we do have to keep switching them around we do have to never allow them to grow roots 
I'm quite happy with coalitions. I'm quite happy with uncertainty, compromise, debate. I mean, you can't have a situation like this again, where a prime minister comes out and announces demonetization without, without consulting. So even let's say it had been a great success. The point is that that kind of thing is dangerous. I mean, what, what do people who want to invest in India think? That anything can happen at any time, right? And it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's what I call a form of micro-fascism, you know? We moved from the big mobs to the micro-mobs to the lynching mobs. And this kind of micro-fascism, which is also going to be administered by Aadhaar, Right, everyone's data centralized, and everyone can be managed through their data. And uh, similarly, demonetization, it was like taking a cricket bat and breaking everybody's spine. You know, that I have the power just to take the money out of your wallet, you know. So it was a kite that was flown. Can I do this? And will people react or will they not? Nobody reacted. It was early days, so nobody reacted. People had faith, which was a terrible thing. We should have reacted. We should have reacted. Equally, these arrests, it's kite flying. It's like, let me do this and see, let us do this and see what will happen. You know, it's a testing ground, you know, to s take the temperature of people. And uh, so while, while we must know that they, they already knew how we would react in terms of, uh, of course, there would be protests and they would wait them out. But so, 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 so I believe that uh, the opposition um, is, is going to be fighting for its survival, as is the government, as never before. You, you sort of rightly flagged a couple of things in, in connection, that this is going to be a very challenging time. It's going to pull out our reserves in terms of creativity, resistance. Maybe we've never had a challenge like this since 77. Uh, four, three or four things which have really struck me is that you have something like the Law Commission today saying that you know, simultaneous polls is probably not a good idea. That sedition is something that should be really looked into again. We should not have 124A on our statute books. It should not be seen as questioning the government, should not be seen as sedition, which has been reiterated today. You have a debate going on as to whether there should be a cap on election expenditure. And the election, all the opposition parties saying yes, there should be. And only the BJP is saying that there should be no limit. And then you have demonetization and what it has meant. And you have a kind of crony capitalism, which we know the way the government is favoring the certain capitalists, not all capitalists even. So they have access to unlimited money in terms of elections. Well, that is the interesting thing that, you know, you had demonetization, you have this very, uh, very, very complicated uh, goods and services tax, which has taken the stuffing out of small businesses. And at the same time, you have the BJP emerging as by far, by far, by far the richest political party. Uh, it has introduced these secret electoral bonds so that political funding becomes very, very mysterious. You have, while small businesses and jobs and the GDP drops, you have certain favorite corporations who have multiplied their wealth manifold and certain fa fa favorite businessmen who have escaped with thousands of crores of money. So, I mean, it's a no-brainer that people who have that much wealth are going to say that there should not be a cap on election expenditure because they can just uh, bulldoze their way through with money. They have the money, they have the EVMs, they have the voter lists. So you're up and uh, they have a great section of the media which has been extremely culpable in doing things, you know, for example, uh, the media houses that played again and again and again the faked videos of the young students in JNU, Umar Khalid and Kanaya. Today, Umar Khalid has survived an assassination yeah. attempt. Uh, Kanaya was beaten up. These, I mean, they are legally culpable, surely. You know? And in fact, the investigation by the magistrate into that video, mm. which was shown again and again by Z, mm. was found to be doctored. That's what I'm saying. It was shown by Z, it was shown by Times Now, I think shown by 
I think. But <clears throat> whatever, whoever showed it, I mean, should they not apologize? Should they not compensate this boy who, honestly, I mean, his whole life is affected by this. His whole life, you know. Yeah. I mean, fortunately, he has a life and he wasn't killed that day. Mm -hmm. But who's to say that it won't happen five days down the line? Shouldn't they be clarifying that this is not true? He didn't say these things. He's not a terrorist. He wasn't trained by ISIS. You know, he's just a student. You know, that's very interesting what you said because these labels that they, that, that they use and misuse, uh, that they, they, they first create and they misuse, and particularly misuse social media with and all these electronic media channels, like Tukre Tukre Gang, Urban Nakshals, uh, stuff like that, deliberately used to malign and to, like, con like you said, consolidate their own constituencies. Tukre Tukre Gang yeah. should be the people who are trying to divide and, uh, this country up into, you know, majorities and minorities and good Indians and bad Indians and so on. I mean, they're the ones who are going to end up dismembering the place, no? You know, uh, Trump came to power in America and uh, Modi had come to power here before that. And one of the things I keep telling people and we have these discussions over is that, you know, though you have America being this, uh, we know what the American state is, the war, it's foreign policy, the war machine, all of that. But you saw huge protests both after he came to power and even when the Supreme Court of America about two months ago passed that horrendous judgment on migrants and their families, you had cities erupting in protests. We here have a man who of course represents what he did in 2002, but also symbolizes an organization like the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sang, which will be 100 years old in 2025, which has actually attempted to restructure Indian society and state to achieve its game of a Hindu Rashtra, you know. And uh, it's, it's, it's uh, not, it calls itself a cultural organization, but it's uncapped foreign funding, all of that. And its tentacles are in society, which are now being reflected on the trolls and social media. So in that sense, it's a much more dangerous scenario here than even in America. Oh, that, that that's true, of course, you know, the, the institutions of American democracy are, are very, very troubled by Trump. I mean, including the army, the media, the courts, all, all of that. Here, institutions have been hollowed out and just their shells remain, you know. So you have uh, those problems, whatever government comes to power next, if it is in them, even if it is in them, the institutions are all compromised, you know, so the, the, what is happening is much deeper, a much deeper problem than elections can solve right now, you know, much deeper. I mean, the compromising of all educational institutions, of textbooks, of what the young are being taught, you know, I mean, even people who, who, uh, who believe in that ideology, they also tend to believe in sending their children to America. But we are going to lose any, any vestige of collective intelligence, you know. With this kind of yes. teaching. Yes. Romila Thapar and other historians say that, you know, India has always been a civilization where the Shraman has battled the Brahman mm. for centuries. I mean, you had Buddha, you had Jain, you had the Charvakas, you had the Lokayat. So there has always been this deeply questioning and anti-establishment tradition uh, which has questioned uh, the hierarchy of caste, the hierarchy of injustice uh, all along and it's not a foreign concept and therefore pluralism and diversity within the constitution is very much rooted in the soil here, much as it's been tried to be crushed. Uh, so uh, yet we have modernity and the way we like you're saying we are going back. Uh, we have, we have <coughs> you know, everything is unique about this place, including its unique brand of fascism, you know. Um, and o o of course, you know, questions have been raised for millennia. But the fact is that, you know, right now, not right now, for a long time, what has happened is that history has been turned into mythology. And mythology has been turned into history, you know. So you have a situation where a bizarre situation where you have people going into the forest where indigenous people live and have lived for centuries before Hinduism existed and they are doing garvapsi. Okay, they are telling Adivasis 
that they are returning home to the Hindu fold. And yet at the same time, those same people, will, the Hindu um, evangelists, will claim that they are Aryans who came from outside, who are the descendants of Alexander. You know, so you can say anything at any point. And so you when do, the story you, of you do, see, and we are you do see the you do see the fact that in many, many areas, you know, in many, many Adivasi communities and rural communities, their deities are the demons of Hinduism, right? Including Ravan yeah. in the south, you know, including the conquest of the Vidyans. So, and it keeps coming up. I mean, you know, every now, like uh, when, when uh, Africans were being attacked on the streets, uh, Tarun Vijay said, no, we are not racist because we live with all these black South Indians. Yeah. yeah. So, I think, um, you know. Unique it, brand of racism you were talking about. Yes, unique, unique everything. I mean, unique, unique beauties, unique complexities, unique pluralism. It cannot have been otherwise, you know, because what, what we also take for granted is when we say India, India, what do we mean by it? You know, the borders of this nation state were drawn by the British. Otherwise, it, they were the ones who tried to homogenize it. Otherwise, it wasn't. Uh, we were not all bound together uh, in this. In fact, the, a lot of the violence of Hindutva is to try and create that majority community that never existed, to try and forcibly create a majority that never ever thought of itself as a majority earlier. You know? For me, Arundhati Roy was, became a name when I read your essay in the Sunday magazine all those years ago on Fulan Devi, you yeah. know, the film, Shekhar Kapoor's mm -hmm. film, and uh, the way you interrogated the violence there. So would, would you just, I mean, just the question of violence. Well, it's really interesting, you know, because that, uh, the great Indian rape trick you're talking about, that was written in, uh, I think, 93 or something, way before I was writing The God yeah, of Small Things yeah. at the time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm just reading it now because it's going to be part of a compilation. And it's really interesting, you know, because it raises those questions that are very moot today, you know, yeah. questions of consent and violence and all of that. But in a very different way, in the sense that uh, of course, uh, the the main point I was making was that you can't restage the rape of a living woman without her consent, because Poulan was saying that you know it's like yeah. people are cheering in the halls and all that. But the other more interesting thing I th I, I think is that you know Poulan Devi was India's most famous bandit. She was in the chambal at the time and everyone else was being caught by the police. They couldn't find her, they couldn't catch her, they had never seen her. And eventually, and she led a, a gang of dacoits who, and eventually she surrendered. She was never caught. They cheated her afterwards on the terms of that surrender. But the film turns this most famous ba bandit into history's most famous victim of rape, you know, and starting from the beginning. Like in her own telling, you know, she became a bandit because when she was very young, I think 10 years old That's or something, right. her father's brother stole her father's land. And this little kid went and argued and fought. And finally, to get her out of the way, they married her off to some guy. Now, the film sort of suggests that she was raped by him and then she became a bandit because of that. No, she became a bandit like all men become bandits because she was fighting for land, you know. And then according to her own version, she was furious with that husband, not because he raped her, but because he sent her home and said, what am I going to do? So when she became a bandit, she, she returns to punish him and his wife, you know, for humiliating her. So, what, what I mean is that so many rapes are added, there's such a lascivious attitude masquerading as concern and feminism is a very old trick. I grew up in Kerala where every Malayalam film, the woman got raped till the point where I felt I really grew up believing that every woman gets raped and I was so furious with the 
fear that this instills in a young woman, you know. So all these are forms of violence, you know, making you retreat, making you fearful, turning every achievement into a humiliation and then then you're rewarded for your victimhood. So I was pleased to, to read that essay too after so long. Yeah. That yeah. was my introduction to Arindati Roy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually that was... Uh, no, it wasn't the first essay I wrote, but... I'm the first one I remember. Yeah, I'm sure the there was one before. There was just one about uh, making movies and things. Yeah. But, but that uh, yeah. one really... Yeah, yeah. 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 It was and then of course one kept following you very, very closely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Arundhati. Okay. It's been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Thank, Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs>